good morning, First Congregational Church. Good morning, Langsburg community. This is Pastor Tom talking at y'all. Uh, we are on week number three of our Everyday Saints series that follows up All Saints Day at the beginning of November. We are exploring some of the parables and stories of Matthew following the lectionary calendar. And today brings us to Matthew uh, 25, where we look at, uh, we're following up the tens bridesmaids, ten bridesmaids, say that, say that ten times fast, and you're going to trip over your own tongue and end up on the floor. Uh, we're following up that parable with the parable of the talents. Uh, so these talents are handed out, and one dude buries it, and we get to explore that one today. Now there's a little bit of angry God being displayed in this one and we're going to actually dive in and find out what this is all about because I think you're going to be really surprised. God is not like the investor handing out the money who freaks out and that's just a little bit of a spoiler for you but we're headed that way and we invite you along for the journey. So let's do our call to worship. We'll light our candles and declare uh, the gospel message in the person and work of Christ. Uh, and then we shall explore this verse. We'll see you on the other side. Loving God, we gather to center ourselves on you, to reconnect to that purpose that we have been called to. Together we find comfort and peace when we are close to you. Apart from you, we crash against our selfishness, our prejudices, and our pride. We boldly ask for this recentering of life to overtake us like rushing waters, setting everything right again. We ask in the name of the Creator God, Redeemer Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We light this candle to remind us of the humanity of Christ, who lived a full human experience like us, body, mind, and heart part of our call to become like God. We light this candle to remind us of the divine nature of Christ, who overcame with love every evil we conceived. And his resurrection proves to all the world that love overcomes evil, sin, and even death. Now Christ is seated at the right hand of God, crowned ruler of the kingdom of all creation. All right, before we dive into this specific story uh, and hear it read, uh, we just got to kind of make a quick acknowledgement here that uh, we are approaching the, the final Sunday of the liturgical calendar. This would be Christ the King Sunday. It is next week. That's like, that's like New Year's Eve for the church calendar. It's like the end of the year before we start a brand new uh, liturgical season with uh, the following Sunday after that would be Advent, the first week of Advent. So we got to kind of look at the arc that the liturgical calendar is taking us and is taking us through these Matthew passages, um, preparing us for next week. Uh, we're going to look at the kind of the Matthew 25, the final judgment uh, of Christ. And that's kind of concluding the entire church calendar with this final judgment scene in Matthew 25. Um, so that's that's next week and we're working our way up to it. Jesus precludes that big uh, huge teaching moment with a couple of uh, parables that are supposed to get us um, kind of prepped for hearing this uh, approach on the the final judgment day. Uh, they're, they're taking us on a journey through our mistaken understanding of the character and nature of God. So you, you can see it in uh, these 
Last week we looked at the 10 bridesmaids and there was five bridesmaids that believed um, that that believed that if they didn't have enough oil that they were going to be uh, locked out of everything forever. Uh, so they instead of entering with uh, entering the, the wedding feast with uh, what they had available, which wasn't very much, uh, and trusting in the character and nature of kind of the groom, uh, instead of doing that, they went out on their own and bought their own oils and like earned their own way in and then came back and uh, the door was locked. So they mist mistook the character and nature of uh, kind of the, the groomsman who was going to uh, be severe with them that they had to bring their own oils. This week we're looking at... Um, uh, a passage where there's investments handed out to three servants, uh, different monetary values, and they're supposed to take this and go and do something with it. Um, and we'll find out at the end that the last one makes a mistake about the character and nature of the investor and uh, makes, makes a big mistake uh, there. So these two parables are getting us to the place uh, of being able to hear what a final judgment is going to look like through the actual character and nature of God. So these two parables are really important to take us to this Matthew 25 moment where it shows the kind of judgment that Christ is going to do. It's always a judgment of love. That's always... God does not have a wrathful side and a loving side and your actions depend uh, kind of incur one or the other. Uh, God is, is not a wrathful God sometimes and a loving God sometimes. It says that everything that love is, is what God is. So we also understand that, that love uh, doesn't entertain facades and fakeness because love can't love something that's not real. So this judgment of God is always upon our illusions, always upon our facades, always upon um, our mistaken identities, mistaken. The judgment of God is always a judgment of love coming. And that feels like, sometimes it feels like fire. It feels like we've been stripped bare. It feels like we've been exposed because we've been leaning on a lie and propping up a lie of who we think we are or ought to be um, and it's always based on a mistaken character in nature of God. It's always based on we think God expects us to be a certain way or to act a certain way. Uh, so then we got to put on a facade of uh, religiousness or a facade of morality or a facade of, um, you know, being productive. Or we just wear all these different facades so that we can try and convince other people that we are the kind of person that we wish we were. And so most of our lives are spent living an impersonation of who we think we ought to be instead of making a deep exploration of who God has made us to be. And when we come into the, the big chasm that exists between who God made us to be and who we are pretending to be, it feels like uh, it feels like a judgment, but it's always a judgment of love. It's always a judgment of, I made you for more than this. I made you to be uh, so much more than you are doing now. And if you would just trust in the character and nature of God and uh, the goodness that God has put at the very core and base of who you are, if you trusted in those two things, uh, then we can we can work our way through um, our own falseness, our own pretense, our own facades, our masks, our disguises, our costumes, whatever, whatever name you want to put on it. We can work through all of that and finally come to a place of our own being in the presence of the God who made that being. And when we get to that place, it's like a quiet confidence takes over and we can just do our life as we see fit, as we know how to do it.
because we're acting not from a false place, not from false understandings and false pretenses, but we're acting from the place that God made us to be in the first place. So if we could just get back to that place and put away all of our misunderstandings of who we believe God to be and what God expects of us, we can finally just arrive at who God has actually made us, who we actually are in this human flesh, in our whole flawed and gifted and wonderful and beautiful and messy uh, humanness that we are. And then we can act from that place. So we're going to hear this parable about three individuals who were given uh, groups of money uh, that they were to go and do something with in the name of this investor. And there's three different responses that happen. Uh, one's given uh, five bags, one's given a few bags, and one's given one bag. Uh, and they all do something different. And it's the last one that we're going to be paying attention to that, uh, that he, he, this last investor has uh, a mistaken understanding of, of God. And it causes him to hide in fear. Hide who he is, hide what he has in fear, in hopes to not upset this angry taskmaster. Uh, so if that's our understanding of God, this parable is meant to correct that so that we can be more like the first two and take what God has given us in our lives, in our identity, in who God made us to be, uh, and put it to work in this world, bringing about God's uh, agendas and understanding, the, God, the kingdom of God, bringing it about. The things is where God wants them to be. That's the kingdom of God. Uh, so let's hear this passage read. Uh, and then with that understanding, it's, it's going to sound a certain way to your ears because you have certain, uh, probably certain notions that have like filters that you have put in place that filter all the stories of the Bible through like the paradigm that you already know and understand. God is this way. I am this way. So what we're going to do is we're going to hear this, but then we're going to look at the filter you're using to uh, read this passage and we'll kind of deconstruct it a little bit so we can reconstruct it to something that uh, more closer to what Jesus was actually trying to say with this. So let's let's hear this passage read in its entirety and then on the other side we'll kind of explore it some more. Hello everybody. Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew 25 verses 14 through 30. The parable of the bags of gold. Again, it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, You wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. 
and thrown that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there will be weeping, gnashing of teeth. So let's just acknowledge that our bias when we're reading this passage is that we're coming at it from a Western capitalism. We're coming from a uh, kind of an individualism and a Western capitalism that did not exist then. So if you're thinking investments like Wall Street is an investment, if you're thinking investments about like money markets and CDs um, and, you know, stocks and bonds and all, all these things those those didn't exist back then so this this is the banking system that we have today is is not the banking system that is being expressed in this passage so we can't just take investment then and investment now and say they're the same thing they mean the same thing so this is not a, a wall street western capitalism uh, because in capitalism kind of the bottom line is what kind of profits you can make uh, and we get so caught up in our uh, worldviews, in our uh, understandings of the economy, we get caught up that material success is kind of this end goal. Uh, that's our bias coming in. And back in these days, uh, Western capitalism, Wall Street, uh, CDs, money markets, you know, they didn't exist. Money barely existed. You know, it's like money was used sometimes. It wasn't a daily thing. Uh, money was, you know, you could barter and trade with different things like sheep and goats and uh, and different different items that you had, food and you know stuff like that. So money wasn't like the only language at this time, like it is today. Uh, we have so that's our bias coming into this, and we're going to read this with Western eyes that say material success is what God's looking for. Now, if the investor is the uh, the person who's handing out funds then uh, and we're gonna read it with our Wall Street eyes and filters we're gonna say that if I don't double my money if I don't make a good profit then I'm not a good servant uh, and then we can tie our value as a human being as a follower of Christ to our ability to perform to our ability to to bear fruit as it were uh, you know like oh look you know we've we've got more people at our events or <clears throat> more more ministry is happening or more more this more that we're always in this more mentality that didn't quite exist here because we're based in this capitalism that says material success equals good job good you done you've been faithful and now you're seeing the rewards and the fruits and your bottom lines are going you know they're headed in the right direction This parable is not about the unfaithful who is just lazy and just kind of like laid around and says, you know, I'll just soak off this uh, talent for a little while and then I'll see what happens on the other side. Where the other two were very industrious and they were faithful and they said, we're going to put the money to work in a good CD and money market, invest it and give it back and our master will be so pleased and happy with us. So this is not about that. This is not about that. Um, Back in these days, it was lawful and it was a practice to bury money. If you were handed a monetary uh, sum that you were afraid you're, you're going to be liable for this, uh, you could bury it in the ground by law and no longer be liable for the money. Uh, you could say that I have I've buried it in this hole in the ground, however many talents or whatever, I buried it in the ground so that I wouldn't be liable if anything was to happen to this, if someone were to steal it or if the investment didn't return, I'll bury it in the ground and then it frees me of all liability uh, for this. This was an actual legal practice that Jesus is addressing here. It's not some uh, dude who was just being lazy and decided not to do anything. He's actually acting according to the law of the land uh, to bury a sum of money in the ground to release him from the liability of uh, trying to double or produce anything from the investment that was given. Uh, but what we're supposed to look at here is not necessarily the money. We're supposed to look at the sentness. 
Because who's Jesus talking to here but the disciples, right? The disciples are the direct audience right now. He's not talking to Pharisees, not talking to Sadducees, not talking to crowds. He's talking specifically to the disciples. And what are they going to be uh, commissioned to do at the end of Matthew, but the great commission? You know, go therefore into all the world, uh, baptizing them, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. All, that whole great commission passage is about to happen in Matthew 28, just three chapters away on the other side of the death and resurrection of Jesus. So they're going to be sent out uh, as apostles. Uh, disciples become apostles when they're not just learners, but then they're sent ones. They're sent with the message of this is the way Jesus has shown us to live. And now go teach people. You're now a teacher, not just a disciple or a follower. Um, so this, this passage here is more for the disciples to say, I'm going to send you out. And I don't want you to take the responsibility I'm giving you just out of fear and bury the responsibility of taking my message out into the world and starting these communities of uh, of followers of this way that I've shown you. I don't want you to bury it in the ground in fear. I don't want you to release yourself from the responsibility and liability of this message. I want you to act in confidence, like the first two sending you. So the first thing we're supposed to notice is that these three individuals that were given the talents are sent ones from the investor. They're sent ones. Uh, and they've been, giving, they've been given authority and responsibility uh, to go and take what was given them uh, and go and do something with it uh, to promote God's agenda in this world uh, of creating this all-inclusive community of love with God at the central point. Like that's, that's God's mission in this world is to create that all-inclusive loving community with God as the central point in which everything else is gathered around. And unfortunately, this third one doesn't trust in the character and nature of God, doesn't trust in the, uh, the sentness, the authority and the trust that God has given uh, this person in giving them an authority position, sending them out, and instead wants to be released from liability from this uh, cause and this purpose and buries it in the ground. Uh, so. Let's look at what happens after this, because uh, some, some things happen uh, next that are quite interesting, and we'll explore those next. So we're not supposed to focus in on the monetary stuff of this passage, like the investment or the returns. Instead, at first, we're supposed to focus in on the sentness and the authority that was given. And now in this next section, we're supposed to uh, focus in on the relationship that happens between um, the, the ones who are sent and the one who did the sending. Uh, so the investor handed out the money uh, to three individuals and two come back with gains and they are labeled as good and faithful. Good and faithful. Good and faithful is this, uh, it's kind of like this, you trusted me and you trusted yourself. You trusted what you're made of and you trusted what I gave you and you trusted me uh, enough to go and take a risk, to go and do something uh, interesting, new uh, or whatever. You, you took a risk because you trusted me. Uh, you trusted me that I was good, that I was making a good call to hand you uh, the five or the three talents. Not only do they trust in the investor, but they trust in the investor's trust of them. Because the investor is saying, I'm giving you uh, five talents. Five talents is a lot of money, y'all. Like, that's, that's years worth of labor for your average everyday labor. This is like a very large sum of money that's handed out in five and three. Uh, this is a very large sum of money. So, to just be handed... Uh, five talents. That'd be like somebody winning the lottery, you know, it's like, but intentional. This is intentional. He gave them the money. So that means that he trusted them with the money. He says, I know what you're capable of. And I'm handing you uh, this monetary value in proportion to what I believe 
your uh, abilities and gifts are for doing something with it. So one out five, three, and one. Uh, so we're not supposed to hone in on the doubling of the money so much as we're supposed to hone in on this trust factor. The, the, the ones who were given money were trusted with it. And the ones who were given the money trusted the one who gave it and said, I believe that you, uh, I believe in your goodness. I believe in your trust in me. Now the, the third one did the legal option of releasing himself from liability. Um, and he's called evil and timid or bad and timid. Uh, he was very afraid. So this here is a fear uh, kind of thing. You focused on my stuff. You focused on your insufficiency. You focused on your insecurity. You thought that your identity was tied to your ability to produce something, to do something great or good or whatever. You, you, you didn't trust me. You didn't trust that I trusted you with this one talent. And one talent, that's a lot of money still. It's not as much as five, obviously, but it's still a lot of money. But this individual was so afraid of himself because he had an improper understanding of the one giving the money. So he did the legal thing, fully legal, to bury the money in the ground, release him from all liability, and hands it back. Uh, he knew where he buried it. So he dug it up when he came back, and he hands it back, and nothing's been done. If you're afraid of God, and if you're afraid of yourself, and you live with a mask on constantly, then we're taking what the voice that God has given us, the talents and abilities uh, and value and identity that God has given us, and we're saying, I don't believe that that is true. I don't believe that you've made me good. I don't believe uh, that you are as good as you say you are. And we're, when we hide ourselves behind, uh, behind fearful actions, when we get into fearful passivity and we take what God has given us and we say, I want to be released and freed from all liability of trying to do anything good for God's kingdom in this world. And I'd rather just coast through my career, retire and go fishing for the rest of my life and, and not, not try to uh, make this world a loving place, a different place. Um, then we're not trusting what God has gave us or the nature of the God who gave it to us. And when we can encounter the love and compassion of God on the actual grounds of who God has made us to be, uh, then we start to see ourselves as God sees us. We start to see uh, the world as God sees it. We start to see, it, it teaches us how to see uh, differently. Um, and the, the response of this individual just, it, it reveals the fear that's there. I knew you were a harsh taskmaster, that you uh, sowed where you didn't reap, um, that you went out and, you know, you're basically accusing this guy of theft, uh, you know, sneaking into people's fields and stealing their crops that he didn't plant. So he's, he's accusing this uh, investor of being a harsh uh, thieving, sniveling, uh, crooked person. And so when he's handed the talent, he says, what's the agenda? What's, what exactly is going on here? Um, you know, if I, I know that this guy is a harsh and cruel and mean taskmaster, and if I screw this up, I think, I think that that's why he's giving me this talent is because he wants me to screw up so that he can come and stomp me. And he reveals that uh, at this at this last uh, at this last uh, part of the verse. Uh, this is my perception of you that I was afraid of you. I thought you were gonna you were out to get me and trying to stomp me into the ground. Um, and that is a that understanding of God becomes our own prison because we treat other people the way we perceive God is treating us. When we when we see that. At God as evil, horrible, harsh taskmaster that loves to just stomp and squelch joy and purpose and everything, then of course we're going to be uh, nervous to, to go and do anything creative and bold with, with the creativity that God has given us. Um, of course we're going to be afraid. Of course we're going to be timid. 
Uh, but if we can work through that natural timidity, that natural insecurity, that natural um, unsureness of, of God and unsureness we, of ourselves, we can uh, arrive at a place of trust like the first two. And when we ar arrive at a place of trust, it's like this freedom that breaks free. And you're just like, I just do what I got to do because I know I trust in what God has made me. I trust in what God has put inside of me and I'm going to say or do uh, what is here because I believe that this, that my presence in this world is a gift from God to this world in a way that no other person is. And then you start to see other people in the same light and saying, you know, that person is a gift to this world. Uh, that other person, they're, they're gifts. Everyone is a gift into this world. And every encounter we have becomes uh, this moment of seeing the grace and action of God and the love of God uh, play out right before us. Uh, so there are some harsh words uh, kind of exchanged on the end of this parable. So we'll explore that one uh, next. So you can't take this story and do one-to-one, -one, uh, you know, comparisons and say God is like the investor perfectly because Jesus said this is what the investor is like and does. So we can't just do one-to-one -one comparisons because that's not it. There is a point to this parable that is pointing to something within the kingdom of God that we're to learn. And so this is not a perfect description of what God is like and what God is expecting and, and all of that. This is a parable, it's a story, it's a narrative, it's an illustration. Uh, it is not a scientific description of the character and nature of God. What is being illustrated here is that our perception of God determines whether or not we trust God with the task of making this world right through our physical bodies, through our life, through our lived experience. Our perception of God determines if we trust God to do that. Uh, if we believe God to be this harsh taskmaster, then we take our identity, our soul, our being, the, the unique spark that God has made us. And we, we hide that because we're afraid that we aren't good enough. We aren't going to bring out some returns. Or if our perception of God is this angry taskmaster, uh, like this investor is, then we will hide what was given to us in the ground and try to relieve ourselves from the liability and responsibility of bringing God's kingdom about in this world. Uh, the world is not supposed to go and be blown up and have this big apocalyptic dystopian universe like a lot of the doomsday uh, end times junkies are talking about. The kingdom of God is, is supposed to be expanding on this physical earth, uh, leading towards the resurrection of all things and the redemption of all things. That's the trajectory that justice has to it and it will get there it must get there because god is that true and that good and if we trust in god's justice if we trust in god's goodness we're not going to sit back and wait for the world to blow up into a bunch of smithereens we're going to be active with what god has given us in this everyday life to bring about the kingdom of god here on this earth. We are to be salt and light. That's one of the first teachings that Jesus hands his followers. You are going to be preserving, flavoring, and enhancing uh, presences in this world. We are. And you find this a lot in religious fundamentalism, is that people have an understanding of who they are. Uh, and there is this perception that that is a horrible, uh, evil, wicked, nasty, sinful, whatever. The being of who they are is just corrupt and awful. And so they take their unique, creative, and loved soul. They bury it in the ground, and then they go about their day uh, being, you know, religious or doing all of the right things and saying all the right things. And... Uh, and, and what they're doing is they're taking their God-given creativity and uniqueness and burying it in the ground and saying, I don't, 
I don't trust God. I don't trust that that is good. I don't trust me. And I would rather be released from the responsibility of, uh, of bringing about the kingdom of God in this world. And I'd rather just try and be a good person. Try and be a moral person. Try and be a religious person. Try and be a whatever person. When we don't trust in the character and nature of God, when we don't trust in uh, who God has made us, when we don't trust in the inherent goodness of humanity and the human soul, then we believe that everything's going to blow up one day into a dystopian nightmare world and we're just waiting for Jesus to come and fix everything and rescue us all. And we're burying who we are in the ground and saying it's not good enough what God has made me. It's not good enough uh, who God has made me. Even though God has trusted you enough with the very breath that's coming out of your lungs right now, God trusts you and entrusts you with life. And he is asking us to go and love God's good creation all around us. So our perception of God determines if we trust God enough to go and actually live authentically. Do we trust God to be uh, to, to be good? Do we trust ourselves that we are good? Um, f flawed, yes, but inherently God made us and we are good. So do we trust, do we have his trust in the character and nature of God? Because right after this parable where it says, I knew that you were a harsh taskmaster and you were, um, you know, you sowed where you didn't, or you, re you reap where you didn't sow. And, and basically you're going to, you're out to get me. You're going to come after me. Um, the very next parable, which we're going to look at next week, um, it, it starts with this beautiful word that says, but when the son of man comes in all his glory, but when, so we're supposed to do a contrast, not saying that this parable is the perfect image of what God's judgments look like, God's character and nature looks like on the flip side. Next week is going to show us what this last judgment looks like, what the litmus test looks like. Next week is going to show us uh, the, the clear picture. But we first have to address in these last two parables the, the false images of God that we hold to. Uh, because this, this phrase where he says, but when the Son of Man comes, we're supposed to immediately say, there's a contrast on the way. This is what it actually will be like. The first two were showing us the errors of our understanding of who God is. This next one is showing us what it will look like. And we're going to find out this, that God is like Christ. Like That's just plain and simple. The Christ that you see and read about in the scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, that is what God is like. Like, I don't know what other image you have in your head of what God is like, but if it doesn't look like Jesus, then it is something that's not true. Because Jesus is the perfect image of the invisible God. Jesus is God, in flesh, in human flesh, walking around living a human life. Like, Jesus is the perfect image of what God is like. And if we can really trust in God's revelation of, of God's character to this world, then we can go and love and serve and be sent from this relational standpoint and not be so concerned with the returns, but be more concerned with the character of God sending us out in this trusting relationship. Uh, and then we can kind of, instead of bury our life in the ground, uh, we can scatter our life like seeds, like sowing seeds. That was the one of the illustrations of this parable, is that they're scattering uh, in like seeds. But this one uh, timid person who was afraid uh, took the, the bundle of it and just buried it in good soil, in good soil, and it did nothing. But these other ones are like sowing, uh, and, then they're, and then they're reaping. Uh, so I hope this has been helpful for you to understand that God is not this angry taskmaster uh, and you can trust in God's trust of you and God's creation of you and your soul and start to live a little more confidently and freely uh, in this world. Uh, I hope you can trust in that today from reading this parable with different eyes uh, and learn that God has made you and you are good. Yeah.
give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean's depths its flow may richer, fuller be. O light, follow. Blessed children of God, take confidence in the work of Christ for us. When he says, in this world you will encounter trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Therefore, this week, let us take courage in the longing for peace. Take heart in the midst of our pain and take hope that one day we will all be free. In the name of the Creator God, of the Redeemer Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us on week number three. Next week, we conclude the liturgical year. It's like, it's like New Year's Eve next week because it's the final Sunday of the church calendar. We're going to conclude our Everyday Saints series next week um, where we look at the final judgment, Matthew 25. Um, and it's going to be interesting, y'all. So we're going to look at that passage. We're going to explore it a little bit more. And I uh, hope you join us. If you are enjoying what we're producing here and creating here, um, and you want to be a part of our community, like our Facebook page, and you'll get notified when things are happening. Um, if you want to be a part of any of the readings and you want to submit any recordings of uh, any of our prayers or scriptures or whatnot, just reach out to us. We can get a hold of you. Um, and if you want to partner with us financially and help us continue to be this uh, community of hope and help and healing for our specific community of Langsburg and abroad, uh, we would uh, love that. There is a link on the other side of this video that you can give. Uh, and we would just uh, love to have you involved in some fashion, whatever fashion, whatever capability that you have, we would love to have you involved. So we'll see you next week for week number four of the Everyday Saints series. Uh, and then after that, I know it's Advent, Christmas. It's almost Merry Christmas time. <laughs>